Hi, I'm Ian Porlupi, and welcome back to the Northland Workshop. You just saw me rip this 4x4 post in one pass with my old Rockwell rail arm saw, which is outfitted currently with a 14 inch diameter 24 tooth ripping blade. Yes, a 24 tooth ripping blade. But this video is not about ripping big pieces of wood on the rail arm saw, and it's not about blade selection. This video is about this accessory right here. In today's video, we're going to make this anti-kickback pawl assembly for this rail arm saw. If you're looking at this and thinking it's made out of metal, not wood, don't worry. You don't have to be a machinist to make one of these things. In fact, what we use for this is a hacksaw, a file, and a drill. If you have a drill press and a belt sander that you don't mind using for metal, it'll speed up the process, but by no means do you have to have a drill press and a belt sander. Just a regular handheld cordless drill and a regular file is plenty to make one of these assemblies. Before we start building our own anti-kickback poles, I want to take a look at a couple commercially available ones. This one is made by DeWalt, and this one is made by Craftsman. And if we ignore the fact that this has a hexagonal shaft, and this one has a round shaft with a flat milled in it, and just look at the ends, at first glance, they seem pretty similar. They have pointy fingers that can pivot. However, there's what I think is a significant difference between these two setups. The Craftsman, if you look at it, those fingers can rotate 360 degrees. The DeWalt, on the other hand, most of them can. However, if you look, two on this side and one on this side cannot rotate 360 degrees. The way the fingers are shaped and the way it has a flat spot in there, they catch. The outer ones, yeah, they can spin around all day long, but not the inner ones. From what I can tell, the only time in any of the literature I've looked at, DeWalt has mentioned anything about these inner fingers is that they are to prevent you from feeding the workpiece into the saw the wrong way when you're ripping. The idea being, if these fingers are hanging down like this at the back of the cut, and you try to feed the workpiece in, it can't because these two won't let it. Whereas with this Craftsman one, if it's hanging down like this and you feed it in, it just does that. That's the official reason I've found for this setup. However, in my mind, there's an even more important reason to have these things not be able to spin all the way around. And that is this. The way these anti-kickback fingers work, whether it's this style or this style, and for sake of argument, let's start out with the Craftsman one. They work because they're set so they hang down below the workpiece just a little bit when you're ripping. Under normal ripping conditions, you push the workpiece along, everything's good, it's going in the direction it's supposed to, no kickback, and these things just kind of trail along. Well, the idea with these is that in the event of a kickback, these things are going to grab into the wood, dig in, and because of the wedging action, they're going to dig in and prevent it from kicking back towards you. Well, that's all well and good. However, the issue I see with this style is, let's say they aren't quite set deep enough, or this is really soft wood, or the frame of the saw has more flex than it ideally should. 
it's possible that these things could dig in, wedge down, and as the frame flexes up, you could get these things to cam over the center. Now, once they've done this and they've cammed over, they are completely ineffective at that point. So you could have it kick back, flip up and over, and it's out of here. It's not possible for it to do that with this because most of the fingers, yes, they could potentially cam up and over, but the center ones cannot. So even worst case scenario, these inner fingers are going to be digging into the wood and fighting it as it's trying to kick back, even if these have given up the ghost and they're no longer effective. How much of a difference that really makes, I don't know, but it just makes more sense to me that you don't want these things to be able to wrap all the way around. At least here, it's still fighting the entire time. Whereas here, they're just along for the ride at that point. I've decided this is the style I want to replicate. If we look at it, it has a flat spot milled into each side, which is what these inner fingers catch up against. Because if you see, they're rounded on one corner and square on the other. So when they come up, they hit that little shoulder right there. So we need to make a shoulder in this bar. This bar is 5 8 D shaft from McMaster Car. And all that means is it's 5 8 diameter ground rod that has this flat spot milled in it. You could, in theory, buy just cold rolled steel, the right diameter, and then file a flat spot into it. But that's not going to be a lot of fun, and it's probably not going to be as accurate as this and the price difference between this with the flat milled in it and just round bar was really really small so it's in my opinion well worth the money to have them machine the flat spot in and be done with it one thing we need to do when we start this whole operation is remember which side the flat spot is supposed to go on if you look with the DeWalt, and this varies by model. So just because I'm saying DeWalt or Delta or Craftsman, different saw models could have different style shafts. So you gotta make sure to look at the saw you have. Well, this particular DeWalt has the flat spot on the front of the thing. So the flat spot is perpendicular to where the pawls are. On this one, it's on the same side as one of the pawls, so that makes it a little bit easier. I can rotate this flat down and put it on the workbench like that and know I'm indexed correctly. If it was one like this, where it's 90 degrees to where the flat spots need to be, I would simply take my combination square and square that flat spot to the bench and clamp it down. That way, when I start filing the flat spot, it's perpendicular to here. But again, with mine, it's easy. I just roll it until it stops rolling, and I can clamp it down. I've got a clamp to the bench. If you have a metalworking vise, or you want to sacrifice the wooden jaws in your woodworking vise, you can always clamp it in the vise. However, I'm going to try and use the surface of the workbench to keep the file parallel, so that way I get a flat parallel surface with the flat on the other side. I've marked the flat spot and I chose 5 8 because I think that'll be an easy space that I can drill a hole in and not get it too close to either edge. I want to cut across this thing with my hacksaw to kind of start it. On these round shafts 
sometimes it wants to skip a little bit. So if I make just a couple short passes, once it starts to make a groove, I can lengthen out the strokes. The curve of the hacksaw isn't big enough for me to get the ruler down in there, so in order to know that I've hit the eighth inch depth I was looking for, I marked with a sharpie an eighth of an inch up from the bottom of the teeth. And now that I've hit that mark, I know I'm at the right depth. And after some filing that sounded a whole lot like the Harbor Freight one inch belt sander running, we have the flat spot on this side. Now all kidding aside, if you have a little belt sander, it really speeds up the process to remove the bulk of the material with that and then just come in with the file and true it up afterwards. If you do have a little belt sander, make sure to vacuum it out first because it creates a lot of sparks when it's sanding down this metal and the last thing you want is for the sawdust in the bottom of the sander to light on fire. With this thing, the way I like it, now I'm going to flip it around and file this down some because I want more of a step in this side than just the factory flat spot. And that's the center of the flat spot, so that's where we're going to drill the quarter inch hole. I'm drilling these holes on the drill press, however if you don't have a drill press you can always use a hand drill. It doesn't matter if they're not quite centered or not quite straight, as long as they're close it should work just fine. I've laid out the four different pawls and I'm using a piece of 3 16 steel. That's just because I had this little scrap piece kicking around. If I had to go out and buy some, I'd go with 8th inch. 3 16 is just a little overkill for it, but the price was right. So it's 1 inch wide, 3 16 of an inch thick. And what I've done is I've laid out all four pawls in a way that minimizes the amount of cuts I have to make. Because if I'm cutting it with a hacksaw, I want to minimize how many cuts I have to make. Before I cut these things into triangles, first I want to drill the holes in them because it's going to be a lot easier to clamp this to the drill press table in one long piece than it is to try and clamp individual triangles. I've quickly dry fit this thing together just to get an idea if these fingers are going to work the way I think they're going to. And it looks like they are. So the board can push out this way, can't go back this way, and the two outer ones could cam over, but the two in the center hit the shoulder here. Now what I want to do is take these things off and just file them to remove the sharp corners other than these. These corners are supposed to be sharp, but these corners up here not supposed to be quite so sharp. Once I'm done with that, I'm also going to clean up the mill scale on the edges just to make them a little smoother so that way they slip past each other hopefully a little bit easier so that way they don't bind up because really I want these things to move independently of one another. So I've gone ahead and I've just kind of smoothed out the sides of the pawls. I narrowed up the points a little bit hopefully to help them dig in and then I rounded over these corners up here just to make it a little smoother. I'm going to go ahead and take a quarter inch machine screw, put that through the pawls, through the hole, then take the other pawls, put them in, and then I'm using a lock nut because the last thing I want is for the nut to come off this thing in the middle of a cut. And when I tighten it down, I'm going to tighten it until it's snug and then I'm going to back off a little bit at a time just until they start to move. So that's snug. I can't move the pawls at all. I'm going to go ahead and let's try half a turn. That's a quarter of a turn. They're still stiff. That is half a turn. I like that. They swing independently. They don't get hung up anywhere. And yet there's not a lot of side-to-side -side movement. 
Let's go ahead and fit this to the saw. For ripping mode, I'm going to turn it to the outrip position and rotate the guard up as high as it'll go. The reason for that is it is now as close to the table on this side as possible. About three quarters of an inch above from it, which means this bracket is now as high off the table as it can possibly be. So as long as I can slide this down and have the fingers just barely touch the table, that's the maximum length this rod needs to be. Now this rod comes in fixed lengths. This happens to be two feet and I didn't want to cut it to length just yet because if I had messed up this end where the pawls are, I could cut it off and try that several times before I run out of length here. But we got it and it's working. So I'm going to go ahead and mark it roughly five-eighths of an inch above that bracket. That's where I'm going to cut it off. Now that I've got the anti-kickback pawl all done and installed, I want to test it. And I don't want to test it with a real kickback because that's potentially dangerous. No safety device is 100% certain that it's going to work every single time, especially one that I just barely made and have never tried before. So, what I want to do instead is simulate a kickback. So the saw is unplugged right now, so any kicking back is going to be from me. I want to set it like I would normally do if I was going to rip this 2x4. And I like to set these things so they're about an eighth of an inch below the surface of the piece of wood. Now I can lock that in place like I normally would. And for ripping, of course, you want to push it through the saw opposing the rotation of the blade. So it would be coming along this way, and as you can see, the fingers lift up and out of the way. So if I put this thing here, pretending it's exiting the saw, it's cutting, it's cutting, it's cutting, and then all of a sudden it catches. See, I can push on that. I can even get it to cam over. But that is it. That thing's not going anywhere. So, I feel confident that this thing is going to help keep me safe.